Hello everyone, President Sunday here. Today I'm going to be going over my first PragerU video, one from December of last year, by Yoram Hazoni, author of the book The Virtue of Nationalism. The video is entitled, What is the Enlightenment? It doesn't answer this question, but it has over 1,800,000 views and 11,000 likes. It is also a scandal, it is a travesty, it is misinforming, and it is misleading to thousands of people. And through the course of it, Hazoni reveals himself to be lacking even the faintest grasp of his subject. This video made my blood boil, which is why I'm responding to it. So without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? Modern science, medicine, political freedom, the market economy. All of them, we're told, are the result of a sort of miracle that took place 250 years ago. That miracle is called the Enlightenment. Of course, the Enlightenment isn't an event that, quote-unquote, happened 250 years ago, and nobody says this. The Enlightenment is just a shorthand way of referring to an entire period, roughly going from the 17th to the 19th century, during which there was a tremendous concentration of highly efficacious philosophical and technological developments, as well as the political transformation of the entire world. But again, it's just referring to a period. It's not too distinct from the word medieval. It doesn't denote a singular movement or anything of the sort. Also, nobody smarter than Steven Pinker, and to be clear, that's a lot of people, treats the Enlightenment as a miracle. If it is ever called miraculous, it's usually just as a florid way of referring to the immense array of world-changing developments that emerged from it. It was very significant. In terms of its historical impact on the structure of the world, it is very special. A moment in history when philosophers suddenly overthrew religious dogma and tradition and replaced it with human reason. This is completely false. Enlightenment thinkers were mostly extremely reverential toward religion. Far from rebelling against it, they were largely motivated by it. And they didn't replace tradition with human reason. Tradition and reason aren't even the same kind of thing. Tradition wasn't given to us by God. Humans reasoned their way to tradition. They're secondary. And they can expire. Notice Hazoni isn't extolling against the eating of shellfish. All this to say, tradition is no less the product of human reason. And in fact, Enlightenment thinkers like Hobbes, Locke, and Kant were concerned that the ossified attitude of the schoolmen, rigid adherents of Aristotle in the academy, were doing bad philosophy a disservice to the philosophical tradition by not scrutinizing more carefully the arguments of older philosophers. Far from rebelling against tradition, this is perfectly congruent with the tradition in which they themselves were taking part, going back to Plato. Remember that in his day, Socrates is the revolutionary, the conservative is Aristophanes. Furthermore, as critics of rigid traditionalists in the academy, Enlightenment thinkers also didn't have a randomly elevated view of the average person's rational capacities. The quote-unquote reason referred to in so many Enlightenment texts doesn't just refer to man's faculties, it has layered meanings. It also refers to the amenability of the world to those faculties. If man can calculate the movements in the world according to rules which are intelligible to him, then there must be something that causes that constancy in the world. Remember, these people were religious. They were highly theologically motivated. Reason was of God. It was the stamp of God's creative power in the world. It was the link between the mind of God and dumb matter. Enlightenment thinkers were generally very aware of the fact that it is very difficult to form a true opinion about anything. They weren't naive on this. The grand irony is that it is the traditionalist who naively takes for granted that the grounds of his adherence are valid. He puts on airs about it, but the choice to adhere to traditional modes of thinking is a reasoned choice. It's a personal choice. It's based on individual judgments. No dove came down from heaven to anoint the schoolmen just because they chose not to think too hard about this or that. Harvard professor Steven Pinker puts it this way, progress is a gift of the ideals of the Enlightenment. There's just one problem with this claim. It isn't really true. Of course it isn't, but then Pinker is an idiot. The goods we enjoy today, political, technological, even our moral ideals, and so on, 
owe a great deal not to the ideals of the Enlightenment, but to hard philosophical work done during the centuries referred to by the Enlightenment. And this is indisputable. Now, definitely it inherited goods from previous periods, and we should recognize these, but this is a fact. I'm sorry. The modern world is largely a product of the Enlightenment. In fact, I would say it's entirely a product of the Enlightenment. That doesn't seem to me to be even a remotely controversial statement. Consider the U.S. Constitution, which is frequently said to be a product of Enlightenment thought. But you only need to read about English common law, which Alexander Hamilton and James Madison certainly did, to see that this isn't so. Already in the 15th century, the English jurist, John Fortescue, elaborated the theory of checks and balances, due process, and the role of private property in securing individual freedom and economic prosperity. First of all, property as a condition of freedom goes back to before 6th century Athens. Nobody attributes it to the Enlightenment. And what was first called due process in England has historical precedents even older than that. Meanwhile, the concept of checks and balances as a principle wasn't elaborated in Fortescue's book, only preempted by suggesting that judicial power not be held solely by the king. And even this wouldn't be implemented until the late 17th century, well into the period we now call the Enlightenment. But all this is beside the point, because what makes the U.S. Constitution very much a document of the Enlightenment lies not in these institutional trivialities, but in the first three words, we the people. This is a direct appeal to the will of the populace as the source of legitimacy in terms entirely consistent with Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, and the Founding Fathers were well aware to whom they were indebted. This is elementary, and Professor Hazoni's ignorance here is astounding. Similarly, the U.S. Bill of Rights has its sources in English common law of the 1600s. It doesn't matter. Same reason. Just because a development is attributed to the Enlightenment doesn't mean it can't also be a product of history. There's no contradiction here. The Enlightenment happened within history. It's continuous with it. That said, the English Bill of Rights is absolutely an Enlightenment document. There's no question. Or consider modern science and medicine. Long before the Enlightenment, tradition-bound English kings sponsored path-breaking scientific institutions, such as the Royal College of Physicians, founded in 1518, and the Royal Society of London, founded in 1660. First off, again, these kings weren't traditionalists. I know it's confusing because they're still called kings, but if you read just a little bit of political history, you'll become aware of the massive institutional restructurings that put these people where they were. I'm not going to come down too harshly on this because even among political theorists today, it's a common misperception. But second, all this argument suggests is that the Enlightenment was at least to a large degree the product of an increased resource allocation toward education and research. And the motive for this was that medicine was profoundly ineffective prior. I don't know what Hazoni is trying to prove here. All this establishes is that kings paid for some things. It doesn't matter. It establishes absolutely zero intellectual debt towards them. The truth is that statesmen and philosophers, especially in England and the Netherlands, articulated the principles of free government centuries before America was founded. Uh, no. The truth is they very much didn't. And notice he provides no citations or sources for this, so he's lying? Like, what else am I supposed to infer? This isn't an honest mistake. He's pulling this out of the air. So why give the Enlightenment all the credit? Almost nobody gives the Enlightenment all the credit. I don't know what all the credit means in this case, but unless you're dealing at the level of a Stephen Pinker or maybe a Christopher Hitchens, like, like no. Um, generally, people attribute things to the Enlightenment because this is when things started to accelerate and began to be felt by people on a wider scale. Like, this is a period of major transformations. It's not inappropriate to say such and such comes from the Enlightenment because that was the catalyst for an explosion of different things, regardless of how long they were fermenting for. But again, no citations, no sources. I have no idea who he's even talking about, so this is nothing. Apparently, because it doesn't look good to admit that the best and most important parts of modernity were given to us by individuals who nearly all held conservative religious and political beliefs. Um. I mean, sure, maybe by today's standards, they'd sort of look conservative just because they're religious, but these were all radical critics of the traditions and traditional leaders of their time. 
Even Thomas Hobbes, who supported the monarchy, was so radical in his mechanistic and demystified account of the world and how authority is established, that his books were burned by outraged religionists at Oxford. Even the sparse examples Hazoni gives, the American Constitution, the English Bill of Rights, these were implemented through the course of political revolutions. They are profoundly radical. Certainly not conservative. These broke up kingdoms. The claim that all good things come from the Enlightenment is most closely associated with the late 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. First of all, Kant was Prussian. Calling him German is sort of like saying Al Ghazali was Iranian. There is a difference. Secondly, Kant never says anything like this. I have no idea where he's pulling this from. For Kant, reason is universal, infallible, and independent of experience. Right, because consistent with what I mentioned earlier, the ability of the human mind to consistently understand and predict things in nature suggests that there is a consistency to nature. Nature adheres to certain rules which are intelligible to the mind, and this intelligibility suggests some association between reason and the world. Kant didn't invent this. It was more or less assumed even prior to Aristotle. The Greek concept of justice is extremely similar to it. What was novel was the articulation of universality as a sign that something is concordant with reason, the underlying order of the world. Kant wasn't an idiot. He didn't think that individual acts of reasoning were infallible, and he was anything but a utopian. In fact, pretty much all economic thinking, including much that would be considered conservative today, is influenced by the Kantian concept of historical enlightenment, which is not some comfortable state of knowledge attained from reading books, but is the result of hard, independent struggle and competition. Universal reason's independence from experience, which in the psychological sense isn't actually consistent with Kant, it is only a priori reason that is independent of experience, which Hazoni highlights should have indicated to him that Kant is not talking about the power of human thinking. This error is inexcusable. Why? Because this elementary part of Kant's thought is articulated quite ad nauseum in the introductions by Kant himself to the critique of pure reason. The implication of Hazoni's talk and his pulling of quotes or paraphrases is that he has read the source materials for them. He has evidently not. He is a liar. What he is presenting to us is a lie. His extraordinarily dogmatic philosophy insisted that there can be only one correct answer to every question in science, morality, and politics, and that to reach the one correct answer, mankind had to free itself from the chains of the past. It is a general presumption in philosophy and science, going back to before the time of Solon, that there is a correct answer to scientific, political, and philosophical questions. And if you insist on holding dogmatically to the ideas of older philosophers or politicians or scientists without scrutinizing them properly, you won't ever know if you ever actually found the right answer because the answer you've chosen rests untested. Notice Hazoni hasn't critiqued Galileo for this. Furthermore, this is Hazoni trying to sell tradition as less dogmatic. Even as a slimy piece of propaganda, this is stupid. Tradition is profoundly dogmatic. It is a dogma. Tradition in the singular does not refer to a diversity. That is from history, tradition, and experience. No, this is ridiculous. Enlightenment thinkers emphasized, emphasized, history, tradition, and experience as the source of knowledge. This is why the Enlightenment was flooded with major books on human understanding, human nature, critiques of various kinds of reason. These were the objects of study, the subjects of thousands of pages, precisely because they were so central. But this Enlightenment view is not only wrong, it's dangerous. Human reason, when cut loose from the constraints imposed by history, tradition, and experience, produces a lot of crazy notions. Notice the synonym for bad here is quote-unquote crazy. Ipso facto, not rational. This is a tautology. The abstract Enlightenment philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a good example. It quickly pulled down the French state, leading to the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror, and the Napoleonic Wars. Of all the memes of right-wing political hack history, this has to be the dumbest. Recall that the French Revolution, despite its iconic status, was only the most recent of three 
three major European revolutions which took place from the 17th through to the 18th centuries. Every Enlightenment philosopher who references the abstract of the state of nature, especially Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, mentioned America. The precedence of two popular revolutions are what made the French Revolution thinkable, and indeed it was first the king, again, not a traditionalist, who attempted to head a modern reform in the political structure of France by becoming personally associated with the state as a whole, rather than the first estate, i.e. the traditional nobility. Concerning Rousseau, despite the use of his terminology by actors in the French Revolution, Rousseau's philosophy didn't cause it, and in fact his terminology was largely misused. Because while phrases like the general will have a certain populist ring to them, if you actually read his book on the social contract, you'll see that his actual meaning was not simply what the masses want. It is the general will, remember, not the general wish, and this is deliberate. What the state wills includes more than just the people's conscious demands. It also includes institutional responses to those demands and the willingness of the people to acquiesce or rebel against those responses. And this is perfectly consistent with earlier contract theory, because Rousseau largely developed ideas that originated in people like Hobbes and Locke. There is very little in Rousseau that is wholly unique to him, even if he does develop a lot of things in novel ways. Now at this point, I don't expect an intellectual slob like Azonius proved himself to be to do his due diligence with such a convenient bugbear as Rousseau. Suffice it to say, Hazoni again, doesn't know what he's talking about. This is a dumb cliché, and he should be embarrassed for it. Millions died as Napoleon's army sought to rebuild every government in Europe in light of the one correct political theory he believed was permitted by Enlightenment philosophy. No, this is ridiculous. Napoleon was outwardly motivated to spread and protect a populist revolution against the highly corrupt and decadent monarchies of Europe, and privately motivated by personal aggrandizement and glory. And again, these monarchies had already themselves reformed to become really modern Enlightenment rulers of just a different sort. This wasn't a contention between tradition and Enlightenment. The rest of Europe had already transformed and was in the process of transforming further still when the Napoleonic Wars took place. Today's cheerleaders for the Enlightenment tend to skip this part of the story. Who? Who is he talking about? Again, like, there's no source here, there's no quote, there's no citation, nothing. He's just pulling this from the air. I don't get it. Why does a man choose to write books and teach for a living when he's not willing to do the minimal legwork to establish that anything that he's saying has a basis in reality? They also pass over the fact that the father of communism, Karl Marx, saw himself as promoting universal reason as well. His new science of economics ended up killing tens of millions of people in the 20th century. This is actually disgusting. First off, nobody says that Karl Marx wasn't a product and part of Enlightenment thoughts. That's simply untrue. But secondly, Marx's economic writings didn't kill tens of millions of people. Marx's writings didn't kill anyone, in fact. A, because they were writings, and writings don't kill people. B, because it wasn't even Marx's own writings that were directly referred to by the revolutionary movements that caused these deaths, so that if we're going to attribute these deaths to Marx, there's no reason for us not to keep going back and lay the Gulag archipelago at the feet of Pythagoras. And C, because Marx's theories weren't even adhered to. Even though the revolutionaries in Russia and China did accept some variation on Marx's material account of political history, what they did was directly contradicted by Marx's own account, since Marx's predictions were predicated on the state already being industrialized. But at the time of the revolutions, Russia and China were pre-industrial. What killed those millions of people were attempts by the Bolsheviks and the Chinese Communist Party to brute force mass industrialization and suppress protests through state arms, neither of which are things prescribed by Marx at all. Marx was a serious and rigorous thinker who was trying to figure out how to elevate man out of misery. The common worker in Marx's time was overworked and abused and had no hope. What Hazoni is engaging in here is outright slander. Hazoni, by contrast, while I'm at it, is an ignorant and flaccid farce of a scholar using the facade of his academic status to sell garbage propaganda to the masses for... for what, an easy buck? 
This is disgusting and embarrassing, and he should be ashamed of himself for it. So did the supposedly scientific race theories of the Nazis. Yeah, okay, Nazis bad. That's a, that's a good take, Professor. Really bold. The greatest catastrophes of modernity were engineered by individuals who claimed to be exercising reason. <laughs> what is this even saying? The greatest catastrophes of modernity were engineered by people claiming to be exercising reason. Like, like really, you don't say. As opposed to what? My fellow countrymen, we need to exterminate Population X because the voices in my head said it would be a swell idea. This is so dumb. This is so dumb. In contrast, most of the progress we've made comes from conservative traditions, openly skeptical of human reason. No, they don't. They come exclusively, exclusively from people developing and even overturning the thought of prior thinkers. Conservatism as an idea is only named in the emergence of attempts to flash freeze these developments when they are felt to contribute to social instability. It's in the name. Conservatism saves. It doesn't create. Sometimes it's very good. But that doesn't change the fact. A conservative idea is concerned with slowing things down and making sure we don't lose the goods we have accrued. We have accrued those goods through exploration and, indeed, revolution. In fact, that's where their value comes from. That's what commends conservatism, because these goods were hard won. What Hazoni is describing isn't conservatism. It's a hodgepodge of things that loosely resemble the right wing today when taken in a reduced and shallow form. It's just, again, I feel like a broken record. This is so dumb. Why is he being this dumb? The Enlightenment's critics, including John Selden, David Hume, Adam Smith, and Edmund Burke, emphasized the unreliability of abstract reasoning. No, they didn't. Oh my god. First of all, reason is always abstract. That's why it's not habit or instinct. In fact, with the exception of Burke, all of these figures were critical of tradition. And even Burke wasn't a traditionalist. Like seriously, this is just clownish. Is he actually trying to convince us that Adam Smith, Adam Smith, of the invisible hand, an idea rooted entirely in Kantian thinking, was trying to warn us of the unreliability of abstract reasoning? Like, give me a break. And urged us to stick close to custom, history, and experience in all things. No, they didn't. Which brings us to the heart of what's wrong with today's idolization of the Enlightenment. Its leading figures were not skeptics, open to what history and experience might teach us. My honest response to this would violate YouTube's terms of service, so I won't give it. Their aim was to create their own system of supposedly infallible truths independent of experience. I find the English language not sufficient to the task of expressing my outrage. I shall therefore refer to the menu of the local Thai restaurant. No, that was not their aim, you facile fad Thai moo. You useless tofu tod, you grisly gang goon, you pathetic plalar prig. A pox on you and all your kin, you degenerate durian-loving Tom Yum noodle. And in that pursuit, they were as rigid as the most dogmatic medievals. Oh my god, I actually don't think I can do this for much longer. This absolute brainless Muppet, I can actually feel the blood pounding in my head. This is infuriating. Anglo-Scottish conservatives had a very different goal. They defended national and religious tradition, even as they cultivated what they called a moderate skepticism, a combination that became known as common sense. I think a lot- No, you don't. I think a lot about common sense these days as I see American and European elites clamoring for enlightenment now. That's the title of a book by Steven Pinker, who is an idiot. Nobody says this. They rush to embrace every fashionable new ism, socialism, feminism, environmentalism, and so on. Remember again that we are listening to the author of, quote unquote, the virtue of nationalism. I don't know what else to say here. He's just making stuff up. It's so wrong 
there's almost nothing to say but just a flat existential no, because what he's saying is essentially contrary to the universe in which we live. It's practically alternative history. This is insane. Declaring them to be universal certainties and the only politically correct way of thinking. No, they aren't certainties and nobody treats them as certainties because of the names of ideologies. Their lenses, their frames, their affiliations, their factions. Like, what is this? I, I feel like I can actually feel my brain cells just popping inside my head. This is actually physically painful. Just give me a name, give me an organization, something to anchor this. There's nothing here. They display contempt towards those who won't embrace their dogmas. I don't know who he's talking about, but also he does this himself. Branding them unenlightened, illiberal, deplorable, and worse. Who? Why? Where? Like anything. Ground this in something. But these new dogmas deserve to be greeted with some of that old Anglo-Scottish skepticism. If this guy's a skeptic, I'm an ultramontanist. Enlightenment over confidence and reason has led us badly astray too many times. Fr from what? From what were we led astray, Yoram? From... Don't, don't say it. Don't say reason. And who is we? Like, I think he's in Israel, isn't he? His state only exists because of the Enlightenment. How could it have led him astray? It's the only reason he and his chair even exist. I'm Yoram Chazoni, author of The Virtue of Nationalism for Prager University. And he should be ashamed of himself. Thank you for bearing through this with me, everyone. And thank you for listening. And as always, do take care.